All right, we're back. Have you watched any movies since we last talked, or are you still on that Star Trek kick? Well, you know, I'm still watching a lot of Star Trek. Um, <laughs> I'm on season five, and uh, wait, am I in season five? I'm either no, no I'm on. I might be on. I'm either on five or six. I don't know why I'm forgetting. I think I I think I'm done with five. I just finished five not too long ago. Now I'm on six. Okay. And six is um it's like heating up a little bit. There was just a recent um part, the ending of season five, I believe, into season six. Something crazy happens. Like it basically kind of like shifts the show around a little bit. And I just okay. basically finished with that arc of the of the show, which was very interesting, very entertaining to watch. So DS9 does that. And I love when it does that where it stops for a second what it's doing and it shifts it for even just a couple episodes where mm -hmm. some kind of crazy conflict or situation happens. Um, the show has been kind of like dark and tense lately because they're essentially at war, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to explain the specifics, but... Sure. Um, but it has been, it's still really good. It's still really, really high quality <laughs> stuff. It's kind of amazing how good it is. But but I also, I did watch some movies. Okay. I decided like um, with um, watching Grave of the Fireflies, I decided to go ahead and watch all the director's other work, who's Isao Takahata, one of the co-founders of Studio Ghibli. Right. And he only directed five, wrote and directed, I think, five features for Ghibli. Miyazaki has probably directed like what a dozen. Yeah. Um, he directed five of them over the years and um, he died until he died in 2018. And uh, so including Grave of the Fireflies, it's five total. Um, and I watched them all. And I would say that Grave of the Fireflies is definitely his best film. Okay. His other movies are decent. They're very kind of mid tier. Mm. Um, for for me personally, um, and I know some of these people really love them, but I I was just okay on them. I would say like if I had to rank them, it would be Grave, and then right below right below that is Pompoco, which was a lot of fun. It was very okay. vibrant. It was very colorful. It's a movie about ancient not ancient but magical raccoons <laughs> who are fighting against the humans because the humans are um, destroying their forest to create a housing development. Okay, that's fun. And the raccoons are fun. They like wear clothes. They can change their shape at will. Cool. So it's a really funny, kind of fun, engaging, kind of quick movie. There is something, it, it's a really good movie. I really liked it, but it is, there is something a little missing from it. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a little bit of heart. Mm -hmm. I didn't find it to be a very like moving film, except maybe the very end, but it's good. I liked it. It, it it was fun. It was cute. It was neat. It had good moments. All these are dubbed, by the way, unfortunately. Yeah. And then right below that, I would put My Neighbors, the Yamadas. Mm -hmm. That has a really cool kind of low-key um, watercolor animation style that looked really nice. And it kind of does this comic strip style thing where the Yamadas are like a funny little family kind of like the Simpsons, you know? <laughs> okay. And they do funny little things. Sure. But the things that, but they'll do like comic strip style things. So it'll just be like one thing that happens and then it'll just like keep cutting almost like these little skits, but they're not even like calling them a skit makes them seem longer than they are. They're really short. It's like 10 okay. seconds of a little joke or a little um, thing that happens. Mm -hmm. They also have like much longer ones that are minutes. Long. Sure. Yeah. And it, you know, it just like keeps cutting to all these different things that happened to the Yamadas. And it was a fun, it was fun. It was cute. It was nice. It's a very inconsequential film. Yeah. I'm not like, cause it's just like a little cute little comedy movie. <laughs> it's good. I do recommend it. Mm -hmm. But once again, I don't find myself very uh, moved by it. Right below that is, uh, I would say only yesterday as well, which this is another piece of like, Japanese countryside fetishism <laughs> where it's about like an adult woman who decides to go visit the Japanese countryside. And while it's kind of, it's kind of like grave of the fireflies, but much less dark. 
she goes to the Japanese countryside um, as an adult. And while she's visiting, she's having flashback memories of when she was in fifth grade and kind of, you know, um, discovering herself, you know, arguing with her parents, arguing with her uh, siblings, Mm -hmm. um, arguing with her friends, uh, finding out about like what a period was, stuff like that is in the movie. (laughs) Yeah. It's really cute. It's nice. It's chill. And I see the appeal of it because it's a very chill movie. There's nothing really, nothing like crazy or insane or or terrible happens. Nothing really bad happens. No one dies. There are no fire bombings. So th- it does have that appeal of just kind of like a nice, chill Japanese countryside movie of kids hanging out at school and they're in the For Japanese, sure. you know, they're having fun. And that's cool and all. And I like that. You know, it's just, once again, another kind of inconsequential movie. I don't yeah. feel a lot of urgency. <laughs> and... The last one I would say that I didn't, I'm kind of split on it is the tale of the Princess Kaguya, mm-hmm. which was the last movie he made. This also kind of has like a similar style as the Yamada's movie, where it's kind of watercolor, but it just doesn't look as good to me. It, <laughs> I I I think it's good, but it feels a little cheap to me. In what way? I would just if I'm watching a Studio Ghibli movie. Mm-hmm. I would just rather watch something that's super colorful, super detailed, and like super articulated. I you know, see. like in this movie, it it does like a very and it makes sense because the movie is based off an ancient Japanese fable, and yeah. so I understand them going for kind of like a scroll, like Japanese scroll sure. kind of like style of almost watercolory artwork. But I just I don't I don't care much for it. I really don't care. I would rather like that super detailed, colorful kind yeah. of stuff. This feels a little bit more. I don't know. It just doesn't feel as exciting to me. And the story is is okay. The dub on this one is really bad. It's really <laughs> really terrible. The, I I did not like the dub on this movie. It's just not a good not not good at all. And. And, you know, the story is just, it's good. Like, it has a good ending, I would say. It's too long. It's over two hours long. I I think that's way too long. Yeah. I just was not very excited or very interested. Um, But it's good. Like, it's it's technically a good movie. (laughs) It really, it it is good. Like, and I I see why people love it. It has a really high, like, letterbox average. It has Mm -hmm. a high 4.2, which is pretty high. Wow. Yeah. It's pretty, anything above a 4 is pretty high. But I don't think it's that good. I just think it's okay. Yeah, and those are all the movies that I watched. Um, yeah, I don't watch any other movies. I just decided to watch all of the Takahata movies, which were good for the most part. My my, I, I just feel like <laughs> when comparing his work, which is very small compared to Miyazaki's, it's like I think most of the time I'm definitely going to watch a Miyazaki movie for sure because they're exciting, they're <laughs> crazy, they have like science fiction and fantasy elements. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have amazing animation. I I just don't think uh the Takahata stuff is a is a little bit more different, but he's less interested in fantasy. I think, although with the exception of Grave of the Fireflies, which is a very high tier movie. Yeah, I've as you and I talked about a little bit. I've been reading the biography of George Lucas recently. I'm halfway through the book. I think it's just called George Lucas: A Life. It's very good. Strongly recommend it. I've been recently reading a lot of biographies of individuals for whatever reason. I read a Jimi Hendrix one, which is probably one of my favorite biographies I've ever read. Really incredible. I mean, you know, it's easy when you're writing about Jimi Hendrix because he's just an insanely wild person and had an insane life, but just a, a very beautiful biography. And then I read a biography of Kobe Bryant, which was fine. I think it was a little too heavy on basketball, which I mean, I I get that he's like an NBA player and that was like his life and everything, but a little too focused on basketball for me. And then now I'm reading the George Lucas one, which I'm halfway through the book and it's just now getting into the first Star Wars film that he made. And I didn't know much about George Lucas going into this other than, of course, the Star Wars stuff, as everyone knows. But He's an independent filmmaker. Very independent. He, right away. Yeah. Very independent filmmaker. And it's kind of wild because like you listen to stories of people talk about his career at USC as a filmmaker. And he was and like he very early on becomes friends with like people like Francis Ford Coppola right, and Brian De Palma 
Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, like these very famous kind of auteurs and everyone. And when they saw his early work, you know, THX and American Graffiti and his short films, like everyone thought he was going to be like a Francis Ford Coppola Huge. type. Yeah. Like they thought he was going to be like an auteur type of filmmaker, even his wife. His first wife, who, of course, famously edited things like Taxi Driver and a lot of George yeah. Lucas's work, like American Graffiti and stuff like that. It's sort of wild to see the direction that he ended up going to with Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. What because like his, Well, because like they're fine. I mean, I'm not I'm not as big of a Star Wars fan as other people, but and I have a lot of respect for them, but they are very and this is actually what a lot of because this is like the part I'm getting into um, right now is he's almost done with filming or he's done filming Star Wars, but he's like almost done actually completing Star Wars. And he's showing it to all of his friends who of course are like these very, you know, big time directors and big time directors, not in the sense that like they're famous directors, but in the sense that they make, you know, kind of our tour stuff style stuff like Francis Ford Coppola and Brian De Palma and Martin Scorsese and uh, Brian De Palma, by the way, hated star wars he saw an early cut of it and he just <laughs> yeah, tore yeah. he tore in to george yeah, he did not like star wars he fucking yeah, he's like where's all the that, blood yeah. and the guts yeah, and he all this blood. stuff he, he he loves he loves blood and uh and nudity yeah <laughs> I, I love brian de palma one of my favorites it's wild and, and you look at all the people involved in the original star wars and you're talking like top-notch filmmakers involved in some area of the process whether that be some really top-notch editors, including his wife, people who built the set designs are same people who built set designs for like 2001 Space Odyssey, A Clockwork Orange, you know, like really yeah. wildly successful filmmakers in a whole different range. Of course, sound design, John Williams, of course, Steven Spielberg, very close friend of George yep. Lucas, and actually offered to uh, to do second unit, to be a, the second unit director yep. on Star Wars. But George Lucas was like, no, he didn't trust him. <laughs> and trust the steven spielberg guy <laughs> yeah it's insane i mean clearly yeah, george lucas put, put a lot of fucking effort into star wars and it took years and years to make a and and i think like while filming it it was like a, a nightmare right it was a nightmare to film. I, i've watched i've watched a documentary a good doc, star wars documentary called empire dreams which i liked and yeah like mm -hmm. a big part portion of it is just talking about how the first star wars movie was made and how just fucked up it was <laughs> fucked up to like the nth degree i mean part of it is because it took him a really long time to get the funding so a lot of the funding for the film did come from what he made on american graffiti so he funded it a lot of the film himself which is very impressive right. he of course uh because fox would not pay because he needed, he was originally going to do universal but universal said no so he moved to fox big fox blunder would... right there big <laughs> blunder <laughs> huge <laughs> drop the bag so hard no no movie yep. studio has dropped the bag harder than that they've lost they've like calculated they've lost like billions of dollars because of yeah. not taking that star wars picture Ooh, yeah and but even fox was like we're not gonna pay for your special effects like you gotta <sighs> pay for them yourself so that's why he built his own special effects studio which was called i don't remember what it's called uh oh um um I know what you're like, I know what it is like light and magic or something like that. Yeah, light and magic. Yeah. Yeah. So we still does to, stuff today. I think it's still, still around and it's still like and I think they're still like very innovative. Mm -hmm. And who we brought on to like start the company are some like extremely successful and considered at the time some of the best in the industry. But the problem was <laughs> was for the first year they spent a million dollars and got one shot. Like they were just not organized at all. I mean, they just yeah. kind of, they fucked around a lot. Like they described it as kind of like a frat party because like George Lucas was off actually going to film it and took him fucking forever. Yeah. Those light and magic guys that worked on the star Wars movies, those guys are legendary when they interview them yeah. for empire, for <laughs> empire of dreams. Like they're amazing. It's so much fun hearing them, how they hearing them talk about how they like did a certain thing or whatever. It's like, so it's, it's very inspiring. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely wild. And George Lucas spent years writing a script, trying to sell it. He finally sells it to Fox and they give him like a $10 million budget, which is like, it's not fucking enough. I think they also, but don't they also give him rights to all the merchandise? So that was his thing. Cause like when they first signed which with him, genius. oh yeah. When they first signed with him, 
American graffiti hadn't come out yet. So he had basically no, because THX, like it was a box office bomb. Other than in France, no one really liked the movie that much. Like critics didn't really like it that much. But American Graffiti comes out, big box office success. All of the critics love it. Everyone loves this movie. I've heard it's. I've heard from multiple sources that it's boring. <laughs> I've like never from people seen, that I know. I've never seen. I really want to see it, but I don't want to pay for it. And right now, there's only like a couple places you can find it. I'll watch it someday. But yeah, it's just. I, I've heard it's a uh, not as it's not very fun. But yeah. Yeah. Who knows? But cool thing about American Graffiti, super low budget. I think it was well, not super low. It was shot for like under a million dollars. The cast, of course, all become very famous actors afterwards or were already famous actors like Ron Howard and it was all shot in 28 days so really impressive film work whether it's any good or not uh, still impressive in that regard but <laughs> with Star Wars there's a lot of like wild people that auditioned for it that I think would have been like yeah wild like Christopher Walken was like almost yep. Luke Skywalker like very close to becoming Luke Skywalker, like could you imagine? <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to imagine anyone else doing that cast. Oh, that cast is perfect. Out. You know, I know that Harrison Ford, because of his work on American Graffiti, he helped George Lucas do the interviews, right? And so, but he wasn't cast in it. I think he helped him like conduct interviews with people who conduct auditions with people who are auditioning. And I think they were just like, whatever, Harrison Ford can do the role. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is another wild story. So Harrison Ford, like you know this. Famous stories like, oh, he was a contractor and they just like picked him up out of nowhere and he became, you know, the, the famous Star Wars person. But what's actually the case was before Harrison Ford was on American Graffiti, he was like the contractor for the stars. Like he had done like work for like some of the most famous movie stars and celebrities. Yeah. Like he wasn't just like your average contractor. Like this was a guy who made a lot of money being a contractor and was very successful at it. And he's brought on for American Graffiti. But George Lucas's thing is like, I don't want anyone from American Graffiti in my film. Like basically the whole crew, the whole cast, he's like, I'm not making that movie. Like I already did yeah. that. I don't want any of the cast, any crew. So he basically took no one over. And he was very adamant about not having any of the cast in Star Wars. But one of the producers is like, Harrison Ford would be really good as Han Solo. But George was like, no, no, no. And George Lucas yeah. took casting very seriously. Like he, ca he spent very long time casting for this which film. is kind of funny I, I i believe that it's kind of funny though because lucas i don't think he's a very good actor director i don't think he's he a works terrible well actor. actors he does not work well with actors at all like there's a lot of actors who have talked about george lucas you're like i like george lucas but he's kind of a dick and he like, does he not just, he I, I think he just has a hard time understanding like how acting works i don't know like he's yeah. a great writer and a great architect but not really with acting he no he is not he uh the way the actors describe his directing is there's basically only two things they'll say. He'll either say, perfect, cut it, or yes, cut, do it again, yeah. but more. Like, that's it. Those are his only directions. That is so awesome. I love that shit, dude. That's so funny. People hate George Lucas. I don't hate him. I think he's he's awesome. <laughs> he's something else. He's, I mean, he's, he's very interesting. And the thing about George Lucas is he doesn't see himself as a director like he doesn't like directing he often talks about like he no fucking he's directed very few movies set. yeah yeah and you can see that like later in his work like he yeah. he stops being right right he stops like being on set and stuff because he he fucking hates which is like the only <laughs> the only filmmaker i know that that hates being on set. i mean there's a couple that are like oh i like prefer editing but lucas fucking had hates being on set so anyways as far as the harrison ford thing goes the producer's like i really want harrison ford to be on solo so he hires Harrison Ford to build a door to the place where they're doing auditions. And they're like, well, Harrison Ford's here. Why don't you just do the reading of Han Solo to like play with the other actors? So Harrison Ford spends like months doing the same reading over and over again. <laughs> and so by the end of it, George Lucas is like, you know, this Harrison Ford guy isn't half bad. Maybe we will bring him on. This is just a wild like shenanigans that is the creation of Star Wars. But uh, going back to your point, George Lucas set, took a lot less money for the film. Like, I think his director's cut was a lot smaller than typically would have been offered for a film of this size because he said, I want all the rights to the sequels yeah, and I want all the crazy. rights to merchandising, which at the time, like, no what one merchandised great shit. great deal. Was yeah, merchandising wasn't, yeah, merchandising was not really a thing, right? It wasn't like, a thing. Not a no. thing. 
and and he invented it essentially. He and he invented modern merchandising. Any huge merchandise, big the business fucking move. crap. Huge big money move. <laughs> huge big money move. Wow. Brilliant. I mean, that's where he made almost all of his money is in merchandising. Like, because not only the merchandising, but also like all of the rights for novelization, graphic novels, Mo- like all that games. fucking shit. Yeah. Video games. Like he he owned all of that shit because the studio's like, why would we want any of that? Yeah, fucking like, wild. another you, just look, stupid move. Right. By a another, big studio. another big loss. <laughs> another huge, huge loss. I don't know who owns the rights now. Maybe George Lucas does. I don't know. Maybe it. Maybe it's all. Maybe everything. I think is Disney now bought it. Disney. Okay. Yeah. Disney, I don't know if that's what I'm assuming. I'm assuming Disney has everything now. I wonder if they bought the um, the special effects studio too. I don't Light know. If magic, they did or not. maybe. Yeah. I don't know, but they definitely they definitely bought the merchandising rights to all that shit, which fucking insane so you know good, good on george lucas if nothing else he is an incredible businessman like that's he's so rich he's so good. fucking rich and <laughs> he's just never gonna make another movie again because why would he like um, why would he he, he made yeah. star wars it's like that's good enough <laughs> that's good enough. yeah that's actually one of the reasons him and his wife got divorced was because like she she wanted like a because when she first met him he was like a francis ford coppola type character even like george lucas actually worked on apocalypse now before they started shooting on it like he was francis for coppola like asked george lucas to direct that film which would have been wild i can't imagine what that apocalypse now would have been <laughs> but, yeah but of course <laughs> he didn't end up going to it. it it's just so strange how star wars and like when you read the george lucas biography as i said i'm not done with it yet but so much of the book is just the creation of the first star wars movie like that's a good chunk i mean i would say there's, you know, there's, there's a good like chunk as a yeah. kid and there's a little bit on thx and american graffiti but a lot of it is star wars because it, it fundamentally changed him as a filmmaker before this film he was an auteur right he was the the martin scorsese the french for coppola the brian yeah, de palma a comma yeah as a independent yeah. guy yeah and then he and makes he blew Wars, them all like, away. That guy makes <laughs> that guy that he definitely makes more money than any of his contemporaries for sure. Yeah, he's made more money as a filmmaker than any other 20th century filmmaker. Like he, I need I need to re I need to rewatch the Star Wars movie again. I think I rewatched him maybe like a year or two ago, but mm-hmm. I don't know, man. Sometimes like when I'm thinking about it and like maybe I see something online or I'm talking about it with someone, I'm just like, man. I want to watch them again. <laughs> they're just so I, I just even even the prequels like they're bad movies objectively, but they're so yes. interesting. They're so they so interesting. They're and the newer movies are fine. You know, just throw them on whatever. So I've seen the the OG quite a few times, the Star Wars, but the the two sequels of the original trilogy I haven't seen since I was very young. So. Well, because, like, I don't know. I love them both. I was just never, like, really intrigued by the original, so I I never really got pulled in. Of course, I saw all the prequels in theaters, so I remember those pretty vividly. And I think there are some interest. Like, yes, they are objectively bad movies, but there's re- some just, really everything is interesting concepts. You know, nothing. Yeah. Like, yeah. It doesn't yeah, fit. Continue. But there is some interesting concepts in there. I mean, I think something that yeah. he tried to do in the original series which he does in the prequels, which is like, he tries to make them political thrillers, which I think would have been an interesting way to go about it. He just wasn't very <laughs> good at it. Yeah. But I do like the idea of like, you know, these senators like taking over and all of this shit. And like, it, it's a very intriguing idea. He just, yeah, he didn't do it well. <laughs> you know, the second prequel, uh, one of the first movies ever to be shot digitally. Wow. I mean, that's, that's very George Lucas, but yeah. And now everything is shot digitally. Like, now everything. yeah, <laughs> everything don't know why you shoot on them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's a it's a wild read. Strongly suggest uh, everyone take a look at George Lucas' life. Also, that Jimi Hendrix biography, which I don't remember the name of. I'll put it in the the notes below. But been reading that, and then I wanted to watch Creed three in theaters because I don't know. There's not like a whole lot in theaters right now. It's a little slow right now yeah, it which sucks. is disappointing There's i don't know why good. like usually by now like good stuff starts coming out and it looks like you know bow is bow is beautiful is that what it's called i think that comes out <laughs> i don't know what the fuck you're... oh are you talking about um the new the ari, ari aster all right yeah I'll, I'll i'll see the ari aster movie yeah i don't know that comes out probably i don't know soon i think it comes out soon anyways 
there hasn't been anything good in theaters lately. So I'm like, I'm going to go see Scream, Creed Scream 6. I haven't seen any of the Scream movies, so I can't see Scream 6. Well, it probably isn't very good. So Yeah. I mean. I might go see it, but I don't know. I might go see Creed 3 as well. If I do, it'll be, it's going to be a while from now. But I might go see it. I saw Creed okay. 2. I haven't seen Creed 2 either. Let me talk about Creed for a minute. So the original Creed I saw a couple of years ago. I enjoyed it. It's a good movie. It's fun. You know, it's yeah, basically just Rocky, it. but just, you know, with uh, Creed instead of Rocky. It's got Sylvester Stallone that in it. Good. He does great. Everyone's great. It's a fun movie. Great fighting scenes. Creed 2 is really boring. It's a slog to get through. The fight scenes are okay. There's some good boxing stuff. I like, it probably is one of the best villains of the Creed movies. The Russians, right? The, Rus- the, Russians the Russian back guy. From Rocky. You probably haven't. You haven't seen Rocky Four, right? No, but I, I, I know. Understand. I know the. I know the con- Like I know what's going on. Like I know the movies. Yeah, but you haven't seen it. Like you got to yeah. experience the moment where he dies. Right. So so I get it. Right. Yeah. I get the, like the emotional thing. It's all right. I will say like the most boring part is the thing between Adonis and his wife Tessa Thompson. Like they have a kid. That stuff is so fucking boring. It's just so goddamn boring. Like, and you, there's no reason Rocky to care movies. about it. They have kids. And... Rocky no, Five it... is the worst movie, and that one that movie focuses on the kids a lot. I'm not a fan of it. It's okay. Uh, of course, with each Creed movie, they have a different director. Creed Two is definitely, I would say, the weakest of the trilogy. Some cool montages though. They go out to the desert. That's a great oh, montage. Yeah, that's right. But not nearly enough montages in this movie. And then I saw Creed Three in theaters. Wow. I mean. Fucking amazing. It, it, I had low expectations going in because, of course, this is the first this directorial debut by Michael B. Jordan. And, you know, actor turned director is very hit and miss. And Creed 2 was just very OK. So I was like, ah, there, another Creed movie? Like, I don't know. But it's part of like uh, the tradition as well. I know. So that's just know, right? pretty much yeah. a lot of them. Yeah. Right. So it's incredible. I mean, so this one is shot on a lot of it is shot on film. A lot of it takes place L.A. at night. There is a lot of scenes at with Adonis Creed and his friend as kids. Very beautiful. Some incredible wonders. I mean, some really thoughtful wonders. Really great looking L.A. at night. The fight scenes are some of the best boxing scenes I've ever seen, other than like Raging Bull. I mean, ugh, fucking amazing fight scenes. Some really incredible wonders. Oh, my God. Michael B. Jordan is incredible in it. The villain slash best friend such a powerful performance and this is one of the most complex boxing movies i've seen in the sense that creed really isn't the good guy in this but he's not the bad guy either it's it's very hard to feel like who you should be rooting for and it's very complicated i strongly strongly suggest people go see this movie in theaters i came into it with low expectations but oh my god i had such a blast with this film i mean it just really hits all of the montages all of the fights just really emotionally impactful film very powerful the stuff with the kid pretty good a lot better than the last movie i know they're making a creed 4 i don't know what they're going to make it about i hope it's not another because creed 3 is like a it's a rocky comes out retirement thing right it's creed's like retired he doesn't rocky 3 is kind of the same sort of right yeah, I imagine that the two movies are the same. Maybe in Creed Four it'll be like Rocky Four, where he has to fight some uh, foreign nation. He has to fight um, like the heavyweight champion of Mexico or something like that. You know, <laughs> just, there's some shit like that. I don't know. I mean, I really don't want him to come because, like, the way the way Creed Three starts is like it starts with a fight, which is always great, and he's like, "I'm retired, like I'm not doing the fighting anymore." So he becomes like a like a promoter basically like he promotes other fighters and he spends most of the movie just promoting other fighters it's not until like the end of the movie that he's like okay i'm coming back out of retirement for this one last fight but i don't want to see that again like i don't want to see him to come out of retirement again i don't know what creed 4 is gonna be like maybe it'll be even better i don't know i mean creed 3 was a blast so we'll see we'll see okay. strongly recommend it i also watched the suspect which is a 1944 movie. I had no idea what this movie was about. I was just kind of looking for a film noir. It's pretty fun. It's a lot darker than I expected. Uh, some great visuals, very late German expressionistic kind of stuff. 
not a whole lot to say about it, but if you're in the movies for a classic film noir, strongly suggest. And then the last thing I watched, at least film-wise, was yesterday I watched The Departed. Kind of been feeling Martin Scorsese good lately movie. for whatever reason. It is good. It has a lot of people in it, like a lot of very big name yeah. actors in it, which I guess like it's been a while since Scorsese. I've seen it. It's good. It's a little slow going at first. I mean, the pace is fucking hectic, but like toward the end, if I remember correctly, too. Yeah, but it, it kind of slogs a bit at the beginning. I mean, even though like the pace is hectic, it's like not really much is going on. I mean, you're introducing us to like a, there's a lot of characters that have like a lot of parts in this. And there's just a lot of like complicated things going on in the movie. So it kind of takes some time to really get into things and figure out what things are going on. But in a classic Scorsese move, by the end of the movie, you're just like fucking amazed. Wow, he did it. He did it again. Everyone dies. Yep. <laughs> not, a, not a happy ending for anyone. Yeah. It's just, you know, classic Scorsese, right? Everyone just fucking brutal ending. But Scorsese does it again. I mean, I'm. I'm going to be the first to say this, but this Martin Scorsese guy, he's got something. He's He's got got the juice. There's something there. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I don't think anyone is saying this. This opinion is not common, but throwing it out there. (laughs) Yeah, it's a crazy opinion. But yeah, man, that those are the movies I've been watching. I don't think I'm ever going to be able to finish The Wire. I'm on the last season. But the thing is. What? Well, here's the thing. So I, (laughs) I bought like a treadmill desk. Because I can't sit for long periods of time and work. Like, I just I can't do it. So I've been outside working out there. I have a TV out there, but it's not connected to HBO. And I don't know the fucking password or username or shit. Okay, gotcha. So, like, I can't I can't watch it. So Well, I guess that's over. I guess it's you're over. Done. I'll never. I'm on the last season. I'm, like, so close. I'm, like, on the fourth episode of season five. I like guess I only have like no, five more HBO, no more HBO shows either. I guess no more HBO shows ever again. No more HBO shows. So... <laughs> So, well, if you have Paramount Plus, you could start watching Star Trek. Before I get into Star Trek, I am watching Seinfeld because I've never oh, actually right. seen I the show. About that. We discussed this, yeah. Yeah, I haven't shows. seen the show since I was a little kid. It's a great. Sh- it's probably it's so fucking peak funny. show to have on in the background. Like it is the perfect show to have on in the background. Yes, yeah, I, I think so. Because like visually, there's not a whole lot going on, and you can pretty much get whatever's going on visually just from like listening to it. And if you just like look at the screen every now and then, as I do, like yeah, you're good to go. Yeah, it's fine. It's a, it's a it's a sitcom. It's not really all about. Yeah, it's, right. Like, well, they they have some moments of creativity though. Yeah, they have their moments yeah, yeah. of creativity with like the like the directing and look of the show. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they'll like recreate scenes from movies. Scenes sometimes from movies. in the directing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is really cool. But I'm early on into it. I think I'm in like season two or season three. Season one's yeah. only five episodes, which is very common for uh, sitcoms. There, yeah, it's but, just whatever. Yeah, which like season ones of these kind of shows is never very good because like you don't no, the characters aren't really well established or any of that shit. But yeah, it's good. I mean, it's still a little rough getting past the laugh track, but I mean it's fine. And the stuff is like good. Like it's, I mean it's it's very funny. It's so funny. Everyone in it is of course great. So it's a great show to have on the background and. The, stakes are so low which is kind of what i needed for a show you know because after watching like the wire yeah, where like so everything is so funny. fucking yeah right where yeah. like the stakes are so fucking high like it's nice to have something where it's like you just turn on an episode and it's like it doesn't really matter what happened last week or next week like it's just like this little thing and that's it so yeah i'm enjoying it after this i will officially get into star trek when i do get into star trek how should i how should i go about the show because i know like you went a, a specific way, like you didn't just start with the original show. I mean, yeah, I didn't. I, I try to watch the original show. I guess if you can muscle through it, then <laughs> I would start with that. But I, I couldn't get into it, so I just decided to watch the next generation. Um, but I found a guide online which skips you a bunch in season one and season two because season one and season two of TNG are known to be not very good. Okay, but maybe I'll go back and watch them again. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and then. From basically season three onwards, it's amazing. So that's where I started. I started with TNG, but you know, if you watch the original series, you can watch all the movies and then TNG and all their movies, and it's a lot to watch. I would say either start with TNG or the original series. It's good. Yeah, I think I'll get into it next. I mean, Seinfeld 
I'm mowing through it. I mean, it's going fast because they're they're so short episodes. Yeah, it's it's good and it's good and it's easy. Just it's so, ha- it's so easy to have they're... on the background and it's so funny. Classic show, classic show. Love it. It's a blast, man. It's a good time. I'm glad to just have something kind of low stakes for a little while. Like it's nice to just have something that's just like it's just fucking whatever. So, is there anything else? I watched the first couple so. episodes of oh, okay. uh, Mr. Robot. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I had read the the pilot script for Mr. Robot for one of my classes back in my college days. And the script read really well. It was a really well-written script. So I watched the first couple episodes. I'm enjoying it. It's good. It's a little it's a little heavy-handed. And by a little, Whoa. I mean it's it's very heavy-handed. You know, it's like a we live in a society. You know, it's one of those kind of things. It's a society, yeah. Which is like, it's a little silly. So if you kind of take that a little tongue in cheek, it's pretty good. It's fun. I think Rami Malik's good in it. It's got Christian Slater in it, who's always fun to see. But again, I've only watched a couple episodes. And I can only kind of get it he- into it here and there because it's not the kind of show I really want to have on in the background. Like I kind of want to see it. And Emily refuses to watch it. So maybe I sneak in an episode like once a week, but that'll probably be a show that I'll never finish. Or if I do, it's going to take like fucking years to finish. So cool. that's it, man. That's all of the, the things. <laughs> yeah. Same here. Cool. All right, y'all. Well, thank you for listening. And until next yeah. time. Thanks again.